In the span of just 24 hours, Crook stole more than a dozen of these side view mirrors. We're in the shadow of the Capitol building. We're told it happened right here on K Street Southeast at New Jersey Avenue Southeast. The scene has been pretty much clear at this point. You still see there's still some United States Capitol Police. We're in the latest business to be burglarized. You can still see shards of the broken glass from that burglary. You can still see the charring from the intense fire. But amazingly, Pembleton walked right through all of that wreckage to go and pull that driver away from the burning truck. With the shelters at capacity, advocacy groups are having to house migrants several miles outside of D.C., often in the Maryland suburbs, making it difficult for them to access the resources. And it's not just encrypted messaging apps presenting new challenges for investigators. The dark web. But when we confronted a staff member, he read off a script. Not the right person that can answer your questions. Is this putting money over people? And Pursuit Wine Bar isn't alone in shutting down its doors here on the 8th Street corridor. Just a few blocks down the road, brine, oyster, and seafood. This is not the first time we've covered an 8th Street corridor business being targeted and broken into, starting with burglars here at the Pursuit Wine Bar. It's just the latest business to get robbed at gunpoint. And while they do have security cameras, this week's shooting here inside Tony's place is just the latest crime shaking neighbors up. Just walking distance from here, there have been multiple other shootings and even some restaurant burglaries. The ambulance hitting at least 10 cars in the process. If you ever want to see what it looks like hitting 10 cars, I mean, we've got a good idea right here. This ambulance just with the front totally destroyed, but Actually, what got the worst of it is the car that it ran into, this uh, Yukon Denali, where you can see the front is just total. Miraculously, nobody was hurt. And I say miraculously, just take a look at what we're looking at right now. The cab, which is where the driver sits, just completely burnt to a crisp. It's almost unrecognizable from where we're standing right now. You can also see all the foam used to extinguish that fire just spread out all across the road. Right now, we're also looking at what looks like it to be a crew checking out the tanker portion of this truck. We're still working to figure out what exactly they're looking for, but it does appear that crews will be here for a significant portion of this night. Now, you just heard those horrifying moments that the tanker exploded. I also want you to take a look and listen at the truck crackling and popping under the heat of the fire. Are you hearing that there are any other injuries outside of the suspect? At this point, we're not, but you're right. That's obviously such a high risk in any situation like this. I-95 among the busiest highways in the country. So undoubtedly, there's going to be some cars on the roads. Look, we're right here. It's 11 o'clock, past 11 o'clock. Well, you really just run out of words to describe the storm damage we're seeing. I mean, just take a look at this. The powerful winds knocked over this tree, basically splitting this home in half. Christian officers say they are taking thousands of fentanyl pills off the streets. And that's just in a matter of a month. These seizures coming from traffic stops. Unfortunately, there were two people trapped inside, and it's just an absolutely terrifying situation. You can see where the tree caved in the roof and shattered through that front windshield. Alcorn and neighbors have been demanding a four-way stop sign at this intersection for years, but the best they've gotten are these pedestrian warning signs. One neighbor tells us she sees mice just about every day. Case in point, she found this mouse dead next to a pair of shoes. This is Juneteenth celebration in DC's Franklin Park. There are plenty of games out here. Let's go ahead and break down that bill that was newly proposed tonight. It would provide $500 million to Monumental Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Capitals and Wizards for their renovation project. They would have to extend their lease at Capital One Arena through 2052 with no outs beforehand. Now, this is an $800 million renovation project in total. Last month, Monumental Sports asked the city to pay for $600 million of that through public funds. So this bill still comes $100 million short of what they asked for. What's your response to people saying under the current system, kids could get away with committing violent crimes? What's your response to him saying you're pro defund the police and that public safety would be an issue with you if you were to go to Richmond? How exactly would your bill be able to improve public safety, not just in the long term, but also in the short term? What are ways that don't involve arrest and that could address the problem, especially with violent crimes and juveniles accused of certain violent crimes like murder or even assault? So what's the immediate action after a violent day like today? And what do you say to people who say something's just not working? Well, what I will say is that um, it can't rest upon the Metropolitan Police Department to determine what works and what doesn't work. We need the community to be involved so that we can continue to keep your city safe.
but what action can MPD take at this point? A 2017 study found 121 high-rise apartments and condos in Montgomery County without sprinklers in each unit. However, that number is now down to 76, meaning 45 of these buildings have made the necessary sprinkler upgrades in just the last six years. Does that tell you that this can be done quicker than that 2033 date. If you were wondering if your apartment is one of the buildings that's in need of sprinkler upgrades, I've created this map showing you all the addresses on that list and it's interactive. So if you click on a point, that address will pop up. Since 1910, black farmers lost 90% of their land or $326 billion worth across the country due to discriminatory lending practices and forced sale of land. The number of black farmers dropped dramatically between the years 1900 and 1997. We just learned the city of Alexandria will be providing shuttle services for residents here to the Patrick Henry Rec Center, where they'll be provided with drinking water and other facilities like bathrooms. Now, those shuttle buses are at the bottom of the road, a little bit out of sight here. But what's still on site here is the fire department working on the water main break. That's actually the cause of these water outages. Now, earlier this evening, residents lined up along this staircase, actually well beyond the staircase case to that sidewalk and lawn area to get some water out of the fire hydrant. You can still see some people are stocking up on the water, but an even bigger line is now formed up over there at the tank that was brought in by Virginia Water so they can get some water and fill up for the overnight hours. It's been like two days that we run out of water. And with desperate times come desperate measures. So now we just like have to fill like whatever we can with the buckets here on the street. Now People are walking around with uh, buckets lined up. Residents at the London Park Towers in Alexandria suffering through the heat the past two days without water, lining up at the fire hydrant and buying water from stores. You got children that need to get fed. You got people with low incomes that can't afford just to go buy gallons and gallons of water. So it's like pretty essential for everybody you now. Whenever we want to eat something or whatever or drink more water, we have to purchase it. And then it's coming out of all, everybody's pocket. Residents say they had to deal with a similar water outage last year and are worried what the water flowing from the fire hydrant will do to their water bill. The last time, you know, we paid water here and my water bill was over $300. And so I called the office and I was like, that's not our fault. Like, it broke. 7 News is on their side, pressing the apartment complex for some answers. Please leave a message. Hi, this is Christian Flores over ABC7. Wanted to see if you could comment on the water outage in your apartment and the fact that your residents are having to get water uh, from a fire hydrant. The water outage is due to a water main break, so we also took questions to the Virginia water crew on scene. Do you have any timeline when the water might be restored at all? No, I, I don't have any information on that, sorry. In the meantime, residents are conserving what little water they've been able to get. We had to go buy water. Like, we have 10 gallons right now, and like, just take sips. And 7 News is on your side. We'll continue demanding answers from the apartment complex on how much longer the water is going to be out and if residents are going to actually have to pay for all the water coming out of this fire hydrant. It's been coming out for a number of hours. We'll be sure to get you those updates as soon as we get them. It's not that we're asking for preferential treatment or to be treated better than, it's to have equal access. That's why Dr. Kimberly Melman Orozco filed a complaint against Prince William County Schools. Her daughter Mia has dyslexia, but was not provided accommodations when she applied for a specialty theater program at Colgan High School. No accommodation whatsoever was pro pro provided, and there are a number of accommodations that have been deemed appropriate for persons that are applying to theater programs. For, for example, having scripts in different, um, in uh, I guess different types of scripts, so not just written but auditory. And the state agreed. In June, the Virginia Department of Education ruled the school district had a fundamental misunderstanding of their responsibility to special education students and systemically denied necessary accommodations. Melman Orozco found out she was not alone. She was in just an immense amount of pain um, in her hand. It's in her hand and in her arm. Yesenia Lassiter's daughter, Bella, also utilizes special education for dyslexia and a condition in her arm that requires chemotherapy medication. It gets worse during times of like any type of growth. So like when she hit a growth spurt, puberty, that kind of thing. Bella also applied for a specialty program at Colgan for art. No accommodations were given, which, you know, I thought also was a little unfair because Bella was still doing 
chemo meds. Bella and Mia were both denied admission to the specialty program. Their parents saying it was because of the lack of accommodations. The state ruled the school district must now provide special education accommodations for specialty program applications and allow students to reapply. Are they going to make it right? Are they going to allow the kids to reapply? Are they going to, what are they going to do for all the kids for the last four years that were erroneously denied accommodations and erroneously denied access to the program? Seven News on your side sought those answers for her, asking the school district those specific questions. They said they could not respond because they're still appealing the state's ruling, but they did claim 70% of special education students who applied for the specialty programs were admitted and they are committed to a policy of non-discrimination. It's been emotionally draining, mentally draining. Really, honestly, truly, the last two years have been the toughest years of our lives having to deal with not just my daughter's medical issues, but with the school system. When I read those words that they had a fundamental misunderstanding and that there was systemic violations, mm -hmm. you're darn right I felt vindicated. 7 News on your side has been relentless in asking how the state will ensure that the district makes the proper changes. We first reached out to VDOE on August 2nd, emailing them questions, including how will your department enforce corrective actions and requesting a sit-down interview. On August 7th, a spokesperson declined an interview and gave a generic statement saying the board will continue to discuss special education. But that's not good enough. So we followed up on August 10th and got another generic statement with no answers. With no solid response, I called their office on August 21st. I'm reaching out to see if you guys would be willing to give an interview to talk about how you're going to enforce that the school district is in compliance. A horrifying head-on crash you would expect an ambulance to respond to, not be a part of. But in this case, medics were not behind the wheel of this Arlington County ambulance. To understand how we got here, We first have to rewind the scanner audio and stunning video telling the story. What drew my attention was a crash sound. A familiar sound echoing across the DMV during Saturday's stolen ambulance chase in which police say the suspect, Darrell Caldwell, slammed into at least 13 cars and sending at least six people to the hospital. Except Rhonda Adams tells 7 News her run-in with Caldwell was back in April when he was arrested for stealing her parents' SUV from their Northeast DC home and ramming through their other cars to get out. Kids with my dad's truck hit my car somewhere in this area. This is where it kind of hit right here and caused this damage to the front end of the car. And four months after Caldwell was arrested for that April car theft in D.C., police say he took a truck he allegedly stole from this construction site in Falls Church to begin his rampage across the DMV. He struck two vehicles. He struck two in there. I'm sorry, three, all disabled, four, five vehicles struck total, all disabled. He is now charged with 16 counts of felony hit and run. Seven News is on your side, asking the D.C. courts and prosecutors a question many of you had. Why was Caldwell out on the streets in the first place? He was released from jail on a personal recognizance bond only two days after being arrested in the April car theft case, while also having a bench warrant out for his arrest for missing a court date related to this crime. I think that there is a link missing in the system. So 7 News is on your side, asking D.C. courts and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Wanted to see if you could say why he was allowed out and should he have been in jail uh, to prevent everything that happened yesterday. A spokesperson with D.C. courts provided an emailed statement saying the D.C. criminal code does not allow the judge to hold a suspect charged with auto theft until trial, but he has to double check the case file when courts reopen Monday. A U.S. Attorney's Office spokesperson told 7 News, this is the D.C. Attorney General's case. We asked the Office of the Attorney General if they considered putting a hold on the bond for Caldwell, and we'll let you know when we hear back. I guess as far as the law is concerned, they can't do much to him. They have to let him go. Thank God he didn't kill anybody this time, but now that he's done something serious enough, I think that the judge or whomever has to deal with him would be reckless to let him go now in northeast dc christian flores seven news both bills added carjacking to this list but not car theft even though there have been more than seven times as many car thefts as carjackings in dc so far this year could the council consider adding specifically car theft i don't want to get out ahead of okay. the conversations that the council plans to have in the fall what i will say is that uh we plan to take up the emergency legislation that we've already passed mm -hmm. looking to make uh, a, a permanent bill to address public safety 